Hello and good morning friends, welcome to CEC Live Lectures. Dear friends, with our ongoing series on history of literary criticism. Today we are going to talk on John Keats. Yesterday we had a vivacious session on P.B. Shelley and as promised we are going to discuss more and more on John Keats. Friends, if you want uh, to know that who is going to be with us today, then I would like to tell you all that we have with us in our studios for the discussion on John Keats is Professor. Bhim Singh Dahiya. Professor Bhim Singh Dahiya is a renowned professor of English. He is formerly Vice Chancellor of Kurukshetra University, author of numerous books and a guide who has guided the students both in India and abroad. If you want to ask questions from Professor Bhim Singh Dahiya on today's topic that is on John Keats, then you can call straight in the CEC studios. You can contact us through our toll free number. Our number is 1800110430. I repeat, our number is 18001010430. Friends, let's welcome our guest, Professor Bhim Singh Dahiya, and let's try to understand more and more about John Keats. Hello, sir. Welcome to the lecture. Thank you. Well, uh, this morning we shall discuss John Keats as critic. Unlike Coleridge and even Shelley, Keats was not professionally a critic. He was poet first and last. Coleridge was both a critic and a poet, in fact more of a critic than a poet. Shelley more of a poet of course, but he wrote his uh, defense of poetry. Uh, and I gave you the background why Thomas Love Peacock's attack on the poets uh, therefore, he became a theorist. Situation made him so. Keats was neither a theorist of criticism nor a practical critic like Coleridge was or Hazlitt was, even Lamb was. Uh, in that age, you had this bunch of uh, poets and prose writers, poetry writers and criticism writers. The variety is available in this age because it was an age of individualism. Before that, during the neoclassical period, uh, you may read one and you may read all. It will be the same ideas in slightly different language in every case. From Dryden to Pope to Johnson, you find similar ideas about literature in general, about poetry, about the function of poetry and its relation to society, so on and so forth. But when you come to the Romantic Age, you find each one of them has his own philosophy of life, of poetry, of criticism. That is why when we travel from Wordsworth to Coleridge to Shelley to Keats, we find there isn't much common among the four. There are sharp variations when you move from one to the other. Of course, all belong to the same age. And therefore, there is a broad agreement among them on certain emphases. For example, as against reason, they will emphasize emotion. As against idea, they will emphasize passion. As against reason, they will emphasize imagination. Now, that, of course, is the common ground uh, among all of them. But at the same time, there are sharp differences also. Because they belong to the age which is rightly called the age of individualism. They were individuals more than the class or the type. During the neoclassical age, you had the type and the class, not individuals. So, John Keats comes at the end of it 
he was the youngest of all. And unfortunately, all these romantics died young. Keats died at the age of 25 or 6. Shelley died at the age of 29 or 30. Byron, 35. Imagine, Wordsworth alone, of course, lived a long life. All their lives combined together, he lived that long, until the age of 80. But the rest of them, they died rather young. So John Keats did not write any formal document like Shelley had done in defense of poetry. Keats expressed his views about poets and poetry in his letters. He was a regular writer of letters to friends, even to his publisher. It is in those letters that we find his ideas expressed. So let us see what he has to say. This is from letter to Benjamin Bailey, 12, 22nd November, 1817. Yeah, by coincidence, we are in November 2017, exactly 200 years after Keats wrote this letter. What does he say? Let us see. I am certain of nothing, he says, but of the holiness of the heart's affections and the truth of imagination. In one sentence, he is making two statements. One, I am certain of nothing but of the holiness of the heart's affections. Holiness of the heart's affections. Second, the truth of imagination. Generally, it is in religion that we use the term holiness, sacred, so on and so forth. But here is the poet's religion where poetry itself is the religion. So what is important for a poet? Imagination, emotions. And that is precisely what Keats is talking about. He's talking about affections, passions, emotions, which the poet expresses in his different compositions. And he says to him, they are as holy as anything holy to the man of religion. In a way, he is declaring that poetry is his religion. Poet's life is his religion. Because what do you have in religion? Devotion. You are devoted to the idea of God, image of God. Here he is devoted to the idea of poetry. And he considers poetry as holy as one considers God. There is a similar kind of sentiment he is expressing and emphasizing his commitment to the profession of poetry. Because the profession to him is no less holy than religion to any holy man. So I am certain of nothing but of the holiness of the heart's affections. So heart's affections, emotions, passions, feelings, he says to him they are sacred, they are holy. Earlier, if you remember, during the neoclassical period, they were distrusted. What was trusted was reason. As against emotion, reason was trusted. 
emotion was distrusted because emotion can lead you astray from the path, from the given path. But here now it is reversed. Neoclassicism is put upside down and what was rejected by the neoclassicists is worshipped now by the romantics. They rejected emotion, now emotion becomes primary, it becomes holy. And the truth of imagination. The second thing that he swears by, first is holiness of the heart's affections. Emotion is sacred to him. The second is the truth of imagination. Again, imagination was distrusted by the neoclassicists because they thought it was a distraction. It could lead you astray from the given path, path of duty, path of reason. So reason and imagination were juxtaposed and the neoclassicists preferred reason to imagination. Now it is reversed. The romantics prefer imagination to reason. They say imagination has the truth. Whatever comes through imagination is the final truth, is the eternal truth. The so-called truths of day-to-day -day world, material world, they are transitory. They are short-lived. They keep changing. But the truth that the poet is talking about, that is unchanging. It's a great statement. And one is compelled to ponder, to think, to contemplate. After all, what Keats is saying has truth in it. So, in every age, there are different emphases. Neoclassical age had emphasis on reason. Romantic age has emphasis on emotion. As against reason, imagination. As against idea, emotion. So reason and idea are replaced by imagination and emotion. What the imagination seizes as beauty must be truth, whether it existed before or not. Yeah, this is another statement, another polarity of Keats's thought. He says, whatever the imagination seizes as beauty, that is truth. So beauty is truth. Earlier, during the neoclassical period, beauty was considered a distraction, that it misleads you, it distracts you from truth and takes you into the, the grey area of darkness, misty. So, uh, that was the thought, but now it is reversed. Now, emotion is trusted, imagination is trusted, and reason is not trusted, idea is not trusted. So, what the imagination seizes as beauty must be truth. Another emphasis that Keats is laying is, that whatever is beautiful is true. So is identifying truth with beauty. Ugliness is not truth for him. Beauty is truth. And beauty conceived and perceived by imagination. Not by your naked eyes, no. 
in a state of ecstasy, in a state of inspiration, when you perceive something beautiful, that is the truth. Whether it existed before or not is not important, but now it exists in your imagination. For I have the same idea of all our passions as of love. They are all in their sublime, creative of essential beauty. And now he goes further into the source of beauty. Where does beauty come from? He says it comes from passion. If you have no passion, you can't really see beauty. The table, chair, all these mundane items of the material world, they are not beauty and therefore they are not the truth. What Keats has in mind <coughs> is the final, the ultimate, the essential truth, not the temporary, the passing, the material. In other words, he is creating a spiritual world. Call it invisible. It is invisible because it is not material. It is a spiritual world. And in this spiritual world, it is the passion which assumes the form of beauty. And it is beauty which assumes the form of truth. So from passion to beauty to truth or from truth to beauty to passion. So there are linkages between any two of them and this forms a circle. It forms a cycle. One thing leading to another. Passion leading to beauty leading to truth or truth leading to beauty, to passion. Either way, there are linkages among these three items. That is why Keats is called a poet of beauty. But then he does not dissociate beauty from truth or truth from beauty. To him, the two have to coexist. Truth cannot coexist, sorry, truth cannot exist without beauty. And beauty cannot exist without truth. So the two go together in the imagination of the poet, poet like Keats. So they are allied and they are fused. They are integrated into one whole. And that is why he cries, however it may be, oh, for a life of sensations rather than of thoughts. That was a clear preference with the romantics. Emotion rather than idea. Imagination rather than reason and sensation rather than thought. And the reverse is true of the neoclassicists. From Dryden to Pope to Johnson, you find a preference for reason, for thought, for idea. Here he says, no. Sensations rather than thoughts. That is my preference, Keats says. Because thoughts for them, for them means for the romantics, are mundane. 
our material, are cold, and cold is death for them. They are dead, non-living. Whatever is passionate, whatever excites your imagination, only that is the truth, and that is the reality. The rest is just a show, an illusion, which will pass away. Permanent things are passion, imagination, emotion. So, oh, for a life of sensations rather than of thoughts. It's a vision in the form of youth, a shadow of reality to come. And this consideration has further convinced me, for it has come as auxiliary to another favorite speculation of mine, that we shall enjoy ourselves hereafter by having what we called happiness on earth repeated in a finer tone and so repeated. What he means to say is, the material happiness, the worldly joys, they are temporary. They are not permanent. They are not eternal. They are temporary. They are a passing phenomenon. Therefore, the poet goes for what is permanent. The poet goes for what stays, what is not passing, what is not flimsy, what is not temporal. He only goes for things which are universal, things that are permanent. Eternal, you can say. This was from Letter to Benjamin Bailey, 22nd November 1817. Now another letter. As I told you to in the very beginning, Keats did not write any theoretical document of criticism like Shelley had done or Coleridge had done. He expresses these views of his on poetry and poets through letters. So, here is another letter from letter to George and Thomas Keats, 22nd, 21st December 1817. George and Thomas Keats, his brothers. Keats has these brothers. And you can see even in his correspondence with his brothers, he will speak of subjects literary, subjects related to his own profession of poetry. I, I know a friend who is a poet in Urdu. The correspondence that he has with his brother is always in poetry. They exchange poetic thoughts, poetic compositions. Similarly here, Keats is doing the same with his brothers, exchanging his compositions, exchanging his views about poetry and so on. So let us see what he says in the second. I had not a dispute but a dispute, disquisition with Dilke on various subjects. Several things dovetailed in my mind and at once it struck me what quality went to form a man of achievement especially in literature. 
he is wondering what is that in certain persons who emerge as great in any field particularly in the field of literature there has to be something special there has to be something different from what the common people do not have it is that talent which distinguishes him from other people so he is giving a thought to it what exactly is that and he tries to define it to his friend so what quality went to form a man of achievement especially in literature and which shakespeare possessed so enormously the greatest of writers poets he had that quality now he says what is that quality which distinguishes a writer a poet a dramatist a novelist from the rest of mankind keats says a term term for it and that term is negative capability that this quality distinguishes a writer from the non writers he has the quality of negative capability in him we shall define negative capability uh after a break thank you with this note we would like to thank uh, professor bhim singh dahia for giving us a vivacious session on uh, john keats as a criticism dear friends there is a lot to learn on the respective topic today so we would be meeting uh, after a short break and would be discussing more on the topic Welcome back friends uh, dear friends as you know that we are talking on john critic john keats as a critic and for this discussion we have with us in our studios professor bhim singh dahia a renowned professor of english in previous session we discussed a lot on the topic <coughs> and we believe that this session also brings a lot for you so we would like to welcome once again our guest professor bhim singh dahia hello sir welcome to the thank lecture thank you well to resume our discussion of keats as uh, a critic Uh, one main say, statement of his that we discussed and uh, which was his creed so to say is about beauty and truth how the two are related he is not prepared to separate them for him truth is beauty alone and whatever does not appear as beauty is not truth for him 
So everything to pass for truth has to assume the form of beauty. So let's see what he says further. Further he says, what quality went to form a man of achievement? Not only in the field of poetry or literature as a whole. He says in life, if you are an achiever, if you have distinguished yourself in any field, you must have something special. And what is that something special? So Keats comes out with a new term called negative capability. He says such great people in any field, literature or politics or uh, any other, he says they are the people who have the quality of negative capability. Now what is negative capability? Let us see how he defines it. That is, he explains what is negative capability. That is, when man is capable of being in uncertainties, mysteries, doubts, without any irritable reaching after fact and reason. You can see the implication. The attack is on those who held high and in fact worshipped fact and reason, which means the neoclassical poets and critics. They held fact and reason the highest and undermined the position of emotion and imagination. Keats reverses it. He holds high in high esteem emotion and imagination and underrates or downgrades fact and reason. So he says, men of distinction in any field, not merely poetry or literature, they have to have this quality of negative capability. And he defines negative capability as the ability to live among doubts, uncertainties, and so on. When you are not impatient to reach after conclusion, why must you draw conclusion from everything? Because then you are not really uh, equipped to enjoy that thing. The beauty of the individual object. You will enjoy it, you will fully apprehend it only when you are not in a hurry to reach conclusions or draw conclusions. In a way, he as a point, because when you are impatient to draw conclusions, you would not really fully enjoy that object, that situation, that person, because the, the object as such is of no interest to you. You have some utility in mind. What use is this object to me? Only then it, it has some value, otherwise not. So this, in art, you don't look for any utility. Don't look for any use. Don't look for any material benefit. It is for pleasure. It's for enjoyment. 
So, unless you have that negative capability as he calls it, you cannot be a man of distinction. Not, you cannot be even a common reader if you are hankering after some benefit, some profit or some utility of that object then you, you, you are not really esteeming the object as such. So, he is talking of this great ability. He says negative capability is the quality of great men, particularly in literature, great writers, and he mentions Shakespeare. Because Shakespeare was a dramatist who wrote 39 plays in which there are several hundred characters. So, if you can create so many characters means you have the ability to visualize those different personalities and compose them, create them. So, that is negative capability. Shakespeare could create hundreds of characters, means he could visualize them, he could enter their spirit, he could know their internal uh, making, their psyche, their passions, emotions, ideas and all that. So, Keats has a point and we cannot really disagree with him. Any person of distinction, uh, leave aside the writers, has to have that quality of negative capability. I repeat, negative capability is when man is capable of being in uncertainties, mysteries, doubts, without any irritable reaching after fact and reason. Then another statement in another letter, this letter is dated 1818, that was 1817. This is to Hamilton Reynolds and here he says, we hate poetry that has a palpable design upon us famous statement like the one about beauty and truth. Truth is beauty and beauty is truth. Here he says, we hate poetry that has palpable design upon us, which means didactic poetry, which is a sort of preaching, which is full of do's and don'ts, do this, that and that and do not do this, that and that. Keats has a point here also. We shall agree with him. Poetry is not lecturing. Poetry is not doctrine. It is not religious addicts telling you do this and don't do that. Poetry is for pleasure. Poetry is for enjoyment. Poetry is for participation. You participate in whatever is being presented. It may be a story, it may be a character, it may be a situation. It may be a thought, whatever. So, it is for enjoyment, for participation and not for teaching. So, we hate poetry that has a palpable design upon us. And if we do not agree, seems to put its hand in its breeches pocket. Poetry should be great and unobtru unobtrusive, a thing which enters into one's soul 
and does not startle it or amaze it without, with itself, but with its subject. Yes, he says poetry influences you through pleasure through your unconscious. It is not obtrusive. It is not a dictation. It's not teaching. It's not preaching. It is for enjoyment, for pleasure. But then that pleasure has a hidden purpose which works upon your unconscious. Without your knowing it, you are being influenced. Because what you enjoy certainly will go into you and will become a part of you. I am reminded of uh, Walt Whitman. the kind of sensibility he has of identifying himself with the object. He says, whatever I looked upon, that object I became. So identifying with every object and becoming that object, so identifying that there is no difference between you and the object, you become just one. The object becomes you and you become the object. It is precisely the same, that, the same thing that Keats says, saying. And then he gives examples. How beautiful are the retired flowers. Mark the epithet retired. Because flowers are not obtrusive. Flowers are not saying, look at me, how beautiful I am. They are not saying that. They are saying nothing. They are just there. He says, similarly, any object of beauty, it may be poetry, it may be a flower, it may be a painting, or it may be anything else. It is not obtrusive, it's not preaching, it's not imposing, it is just there. And being there is an enjoyment and is a learning. So it's a process which works through the unconscious, not through the conscious mind. So how beautiful are the retired flowers? How would they lose their beauty were they to throng into the highway, crying out, admire me, I am a violet. Dote upon me, I am a primrose. He says they are beautiful because they stay placid wherever they are. They don't jump out of the flower bed and come on to the highway or the roadside and cry out, look at me, how beautiful I am. They don't say anything. They are just there. A beautiful example. He says that is the position of any piece of art. It may be a poem, it may be a flower, it may be a painting. They are just there, and being there, They are an object of pleasure and an object of truth. So beauty and truth, Keats is not prepared to separate. The two, he says, goes together. And truth, he means the essential, the spiritual, the eternal truth. Not what one A, B, C, D or anyone else designates as truth. That's not truth. That is vested interest. And he goes on. 
In poetry, this is another letter of February 27, 1818, this time to John Taylor. In poetry, I have a few axioms, and you will see how far I am from their center. First, I think poetry should surprise by a fine excess and not by singularity. Means the pleasure, the enjoyment that the beauty offers should be overwhelming. That will speak for itself. It doesn't need to be obtrusive. It doesn't need to be pointed. It doesn't need to be singular. Great thing, he's saying. In poetry, I have a few axioms, he says, and first one is, poetry should surprise by a fine excess, not by singularity. It should strike the reader as a wording of his own highest thoughts and appear almost a remembrance. Again, something to think about, something to ponder over. He says great art does not surprise you by its singularity. It overwhelms you. First, you feel as if I, it is something that relates to me. Something that you can share. You feel as if it's your own. Your own feeling or emotion or idea. Your thought. So it is participatory. And it is through this unconscious process of identification of participation that art works. It affects you. It influences you. So that is the difference between the morality of art, the beauty of art, and that of preaching, indoctrination, or any kind of obtrusive presentation. Very great. It is easier to think what poetry should be than write it. And this leads me on to another axiom, that if poetry comes not as naturally as leaves to a tree, it had better not come at all. Sir, we have a caller with us, so let's take a question. Okay, Hello. sure. <coughs> Hello. Hello, ma'am. Yes, good, uh, good morning, ma'am. Yes. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Please tell your name and ask your question. Uh, my name is Pawan Giri. Yes, sir, Pawan. I want to know about the romanticism in the John Keats poet, poem. He just wanted to know the romanticism in John Keats poems. <laughs> Well, every poem that he wrote has romanticism in it. And as I was explaining, romanticism means not that it is devoid of ideas. Ideas are there. Truth is there. But truth is as it is perceived through imagination, through vision, not the mundane truth of uh, this is table and this is chair. So beautiful things to Keats. Beauty is truth and truth is beauty. So it has to be perceived through imagination. So whatever appeals to your imagination is the truth for him and not otherwise. Hope Pawan might have got the answer of his question. So, sir, let's uh, carry forward the lecture and uh, let's talk a little more on uh, ah, John sure. Keats. Sure, there is. 
So it is easier to think what poetry should be than to write it. And this leads me to another axiom that is that if poetry comes not as naturally as leaves to a tree, it had better not come at all. This is romanticism. This is the romantic emphasis that poetry should be spontaneous. It should be compelling you from within so that you leave everything and rush to your pen and paper and you write, which means the inner compulsion of your emotion, of your passion, of the concentration of some thought. There are times when something is bothering you and you are trying to know, you keep thinking, 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 but this process leads to saturation. And you reach a point when suddenly there is a perception. There is an insight, yes, now I know what it is. And then you rush for your pen and paper and you write it. So he's talking of this. That was the romantic emphasis that poetry has to be spontaneous, like the leaves to a tree. There is no design. There is no, you see, dictation. There is no compulsion. Leaves come naturally to a tree. He says, similarly, if a poetry is forced, if a poetry is labored, it's not really much of a poetry. He always has at the back of his mind the neoclassical poets like Dryden and Pope or Johnson. Because their poetry is not spontaneous. They will not trust spontaneity. They will distrust it. For them, poetry has to be labored. You have to work out your ideas. You have to work out your preferences. And you talk of your prejudices. So that is a mundane kind of activity to a romantic, to Keats. For Keats, poetry is only the one which comes out spontaneously. It flows like the river does. It is beautiful like the flower is. So beauty and truth are inseparable for John Keats. So what, sir, we are going to study more because we are on the verge of completing the series that is on a history of literary criticism. So what uh, next we are going to study in the future sessions? Well, there is a uh, there's lot that remains, but we will try to wind it up. Uh, next is the Victorian age after the Romantic. And in the Victorian age, if we choose one critic each age, uh, Matthew Arnold is the most important one because he is representative of the age, like Shelley Keats. In this, we did three Wordsworth Shelley Keats. But Matthew Arnold alone can represent the entire age because he was the theorist. Tennyson, of course, as a poet, is representative, but he is not a theorist. Theorist is Matthew Arnold. And similarly, T.S. Eliot, he is the theorist of the modernist period, modern age, which comes after World War I, so on and so forth. When we talk about different ages, uh, are these age, were these ages were, uh, have a different reflection or does uh, there is a connection between the two ages? Well, uh, history cannot be abrupt. There are always linkages. At the same time, there are new emphases come. So both things continue. That's what makes it a stream, a history, just like the river. Uh, the water flows over different terrains. Sometimes it is rocky, sometimes it is sandy, Sometimes it is smooth, sometimes it is jerky, but then it goes on. Similarly, literary history goes through all sorts of ups and downs, 
phases, uh, phases of emotions, thoughts. So, history is history. Linkages will always be there and there will be new emphasis also. When we talk about uh, poetry individually, uh, so the uh, context or the lifestyle or the ages changes, but as you said, the emotions, the emotions remains the same. So, can we say that the uh, emotions which uh, were uh, 100 centuries or centuries back were the same as they are today? Of course. For example, the emotion of love, I don't think it ever changes. You can go back to the ancient times, read Homer, and you can come down to the present and today's love, it will not be different. There are certain eternal passions, emotions uh, uh, to humanity. They will always remain the same. Ages change, materially things change, but spiritually man remains the same. So same preferences, prejudices, loves, hatreds, that will remain. Definitely, dear friends, we will also be the same for you every time and we try to bring for you different sessions on different subjects. If you want to see more of our lectures which goes live, you can see those lectures as we upload the recorded lectures on YouTube. You can just log on www.youtube.com slash CEC Edusat. This is the YouTube channel of CEC where you can log on and you can see the ample of lectures on different subjects subjects of your interest friends today we are taking your leave but uh, we would be meeting again very soon and would be continuing our series on history of uh, literary criticism so keep watching us and keep writing us at info.cec at nic.in we would be meeting soon till then take care goodbye thank you sir thank you so very much thank you very much